Right, welcome back. Oh, <clears throat> let's pick up from where we stopped. So any questions from uh, uh, chapter three and four? Any questions? No questions? OK, so chapter five, six, and seven are relatively smaller chapters, and there's quite a few repetitions. So we'll try and uh, see if we can finish these three chapters in this one session. Uh, Okay. Yes, Christopher, you have a question? Uh, yes, Pastor. I wanted yes. to find out uh, whether uh, there's, I mean, the learnings that we get from uh, Chapter 3 uh, to regard to the Old Covenant, mm. um, uh, how would we apply those, uh, would we be uh, in a position to apply those uh, learnings in our, in our lives, or is it... Um, just all about the the new covenant that uh, we should uh, we should use yeah so christopher it's very important to understand that see the old covenant is very very important so even now as new covenant believers it, we can't do away with the old covenant right it is important now uh, picture this we, we are reading you know the book of we're reading about david right you learn so many practical things from him. Reading about, uh, you know, Daniel, and and the life that he led. Joseph. There's so much that we can learn from them. Principles, their lives, how they were, you know, for and how God. And when we also look at how God was, you know, in, you know, the ministry of the old covenant was glorious, right? Paul is not saying it wasn't glorious. It's just that the ministry of the new covenant is even more glorious, right? So, in the old covenant. Yes, there's there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of people, a lot of prophets that God used, and a lot of miracles that we see in the old covenant. Now, why is Paul saying it's not? Uh, you know, why the new covenant is more glorious? Is basically because the old covenant. We know the ministry of the Holy Spirit would come and it would go back, right? And it there was still no forgiveness of sins. There was no remission of sins, right? But here on the new covenant, we have the ministry of the Holy Spirit always with us. We have the assurance of forgiveness of sins. This is not a ministry of condemnation. So when you wait both together, what Jesus did was he fulfilled the law, but he also gave something extra, right? Like a, uh, you know, like a bumper gift, right? It's not that he gave this, you know. Uh, you got the old covenant, you got, okay, Jesus died on the cross, but he resurrected and he poured out the Abrahamic blessings, the blessings of the cross, everything is ours. So Christopher, to answer your question, we need the old covenant. We can use, there are a lot of pr uh, principles, a lot of, lot of lessons that we can learn from the old covenant. Uh, but we must understand that we are, you know, we must not go, hey, the Holy Spirit came and went to the old covenant, so even right now he's doing that. No, the new covenant is great. He's here. Right? The Holy Spirit is with us, unlike in the old covenant. So there are certain things, uh, certain areas that we must understand. But it's but you know, the old covenant is beautiful, it's very important. So as believers, we must read it. We must be uh, you know, if we are doing Christology, if you're doing a study on Christology, we have to know the old testament. Jesus said, I've come to fulfill the law. Right. So we must know about that. So we can't do away with the old covenant, right? So uh, no, actually, Pastor, I'm referring more towards the uh, you know the laws and um, possibly I don't, I'm not sure if the Ten Commandments is included in, the, in that old covenant. Uh, covenant, mm -hmm. um, not 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 really about the the Old Testament versus New Testament. More about the laws and um, mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, how they were. Uh, you know how they've interpreted and how how people live their lives based on how we need to live, live our lives uh, you know based on the new covenant yeah so in terms of the law christopher so we know that god gave moses the law the ten commandments and then followed up with you know many many rules and regulations that were uh, involved now we know that we cannot do away with the ten commandments right what did jesus say if you love the lord your god love your neighbor you fulfill all of those commandments. Now, we don't follow the religious laws that were there in the old covenant. 
they're all done away with right so we we don't have to get circumcised we don't have to go do a guilt offering sin offering pain offering all of those offerings are not required at all because the lord jesus has fulfilled all of those offerings now why were those offerings even come into place and why were those religious systems there it was you know the whole offerings levitical offerings pointed to jesus right so we don't have to do all of that if we don't have to follow the religious systems that were that happened during that time uh, uh you know in the old covenant uh, but what we have to do what we do is we we do follow the principles love the lord your god it's a law of the old covenant but the principle is still there in the new covenant right uh but the religious systems if you're talking about you know those offerings and uh, the way we have to you know dress up the way we have to uh you know uh you know we, we see in the old covenant you know, the high priest would go once in a year and there was this a uh, sense of awe and reverence and and you know you have to take off your footwear you have to you know do these kind of things and uh, so these are all religious systems that were set in place but now in the new covenant it is those who worship the father or worship the lord worship him in spirit and in truth so so all of those systems religious systems are gone away but the principles of the law not the the principles of love the lord your god honor your father and mother are still there even paul talks about uh, you know parents children and parents i think it's i think it's in this chapter itself or uh, i don't know if it's in this book but uh, he talks about right he talks about uh, children and parents obey uh, children obey your parents now uh, that is given many years back but the principle still stays just because the holy spirit comes doesn't mean that changes right so we must be in, understand that there are some things uh the law in 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 terms we are we don't have to follow the the circumcision and all those things but the principles of those of those law of the law which god had given us still stay right but paul again says the law is power, powerless now what is he saying why is he saying that the law is powerless because the jews were putting all their attention on the law rather than putting their attention on jesus right so that's why he's saying the law is powerless why is he then telling the galatians why is he so upset he's saying why are you going to get circumcised doing these religious things when you have when the lord jesus has done away with it right he says we need to circumcise our heart not a physical body right so so you see the principles are still there but you don't have to but there you don't follow the laws in the natural and uh, this why i hope that makes a little you know brings a little clarity to your question okay all right so let's do this let's get into chapter 5 right let's try and complete chapter 5 6 and if we can let's do even 7 all right chapter 5 okay so now in chapter 5 paul is assuring the believers uh talking about death and resurrection and why as we uh, and what Uh, should we as believers have these two perspectives uh, in terms of resurrection so let's look at that verse 1 to 4 for we know that if our earthly house this tent is destroyed we have a building from god a house not made of with hands but eternal in the heavens for in this we we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven if indeed having been clothed we shall not be found naked for we who are in this tent groan being burdened not because we want to be unclothed but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life so paul here is referring to a physical body and he's saying this tent a tent is temporary 
uh, you can take off the tent. You know, if you've seen, uh, you know, I've just been in Rajasthan and I saw these people who would make tents. They just quickly make a tent and they would, you know, remove it off the ground uh, and they would, they can just move on in their journey and build another tent. So it's a temporary dwelling. But we have on this earth, we have a temporary dwelling, but in heaven, we have a building from God, an eternal house. Now, a building is not easily broken down. You can't just, it's not temporary. It's, it lasts for a long time, years, you know. Uh, the spiritual body is for all believers who will be raised up, right? So Paul is saying, this tent is going to be destroyed, but we have a building in heaven, right? Uh, First Corinthians 15, again here Paul is saying, uh, remember we talked about it, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised up in glory, it is sown in weakness, raised up in power, it is sown a natural body, raised up in a spiritual body, there is a natural body and then there is a spiritual body. We talked about this, right, we spent a lot of time talking about this, um, right, uh, how the natural body is sown uh, in, uh, you know, in uh, dishonor. But it's raised up in glory. It is a weak body, but when it is given a glorified body, it has power. It is natural right now. We feel hungry, we feel thirsty, we feel tired, but now it'll be raised up as a spiritual body. Right? Now, verse 5 through 8. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we're always confident that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So Paul is bringing out this beautiful, uh, you know, this comparison here. First, he says, we have this indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, which is a guarantee to our. Uh, you know, full redemption, meaning our uh, glorified form, right? It's a guarantee. Now, people may ask you, or they may ask us all as Christians, how do you know there's a heaven and there's a hell? I mean, or how do you know you're going to go to heaven? Hey, we have a guarantee. Who's that guarantee? The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And what is his promise? His promise says, now they may say, you know, I remember some of them asking me, where's the Holy Spirit? Hey, the Holy Spirit is a spirit. You can't see it, but he uses our senses. And that's our guarantee. right? So as believers, when we die, we have a guarantee that we will be in the presence of God. Because to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. There is no in-between place. There is no place where the souls will go and sit and wait and, uh, you know, uh, pay for repentance and all of those things. Those are all wrong understandings. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. To be present in the body is to know that, yes, we are absent with the Lord, but the deposit of the Holy Spirit is in us. So we have this faith in us. right? We have this faith that there will come a time when we die, to be absent in the body, we will be present with the Lord. Faith, you know, faith is something that we can't see. But the moment we are absent in the body, faith will see. Right? Can you picture that? Right? The moment we are absent in the body, the moment we pass away, what we've been having faith on, but, oh, Jesus, you know, Holy Spirit is our inheritance. One day we will see you face to face. That faith will become sight. Now, what a joy that is. And Paul is saying here in verse 9 onwards, he's talking about the judgment seat of Christ, which all believers will have to stand in front of. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 
Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God. And I also trust we are well known in our conscience. Right? It's wonderful here. Paul is saying, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing with him, because we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm sure we've learned this uh, in eschatology, the end times as well, where we the judgment seat of Christ is a judge is a is a place called the bema seat where we'll all believers will stand and we will receive. It's also called as the uh, judgment of rewards, right? So we will all only the believers will stand in this judgment seat. Now, why why do we have to stand? We will be rewarded, rewarded for the works that we have done. Later on, Paul says the works that will be tested by fire. And that which remains will only be rewarded. That which is burnt away will not be rewarded. But we all will stand in the judgment seat of Christ. Right? Uh, let's go down. The phrase judgment seat is a single word in the ancient Greek language of the New Testament. Dima literally means step, as in a raised platform or seat. Uh, and usually the, this is where the Roman magistrate sat and acted as a judge. Now, this is not, as I said, this is not the judgment of condemnation. The great white throne judgment is for those who have not accepted the Lord. Right. So that is the judgment. If you read Revelations, the, uh, you know, the, the earth scrolled up, the mountains uh, melted like wax and those people said hide us from the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb that is the judgment seat of the great white throne judgment where the unbelievers will stand there giving giving an account of their lives that is a terrible place to be in the judgment seat of christ is a judgment of rewards for believers how we lived our life and how we did with the call of God on our life, with the gifting, with the anointing that God has placed, were we faithful? And God will reward us. Right Now, Paul here, having seen and known the fear of the Lord and the severity of the judgment of not receiving salvation, he's pleading with the uh, believers, saying to make things right, because we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Right? Verse 12 onwards, for we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in the appearance, not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge this, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Now Paul, again, he's not commending himself or his team to the Corinthians, but what does he do? He asks them to consider and boast about Paul and his team who are, you know, going through difficult challenges, going through difficult times. Right Now, the Corinthians seem to have, you know, it says that seem to have been in the habit of superficial and being, being of superficial and being swayed in their judgment and mannerisms. Right Now, why do we say this? You remember in, uh, in First Corinthians, they were very superficial. Oh, you know, one is they were saying, okay, I will follow Paul, I will follow Cephas. The other is they partaking the Lord's table without even understanding, very superficially. Okay, this is the Lord's table, let's just eat of it. Right? So, so their mannerisms were all swayed, very superficial. So now it's not all of them. This is the general feel of the church at that time. Right now, Paul is saying, you know, let the love of Christ compel you in what you're doing. Right? He goes on, verse 13 to 14. For if we are besides ourselves, it is for God. Right? 
uh, if me and Apostle Paul saying, if me and my team did anything uh, radical and seemed to be foolish, it was for the sake of God. Now think of this. Paul, why do you want to go to Judea and to Jerusalem when you know that they are searching for you and they want to kill you? Because the Holy Spirit is leading them. It is for the sake of God. It is for the sake of the kingdom. Paul, why do you want to go into Macedonia when Macedonia, again, there is a lot of persecution. It's not good ground. Why do you want to go there? Why don't you go to places like you know Philippi or uh, Thessalonica where things are easy? There's not much of persecution. You're a Roman citizen. Why don't you go to Rome? No. Why, why are you going through all of this? Because of the sake of the gospel. Right? Everything Paul said and did in the ministry was motivated by the love of Christ. When he exemplified it while he was writing First Corinthians, you know, First Corinthians thirteen, he says, "Now listen, uh, uh, I'm bringing all this correction to you, but why am I doing it? Because I love you. I love each one of you, just like how Christ loved the church. I love the church. I love you all. So I have to bring this correction." Everything that Apostle Paul did was motivated by the love of Christ. Whether it was correction, whether it was, uh, you know, um, bringing reproof, whether it was exhortation, whether it was uh, just encouraging, whether it was raising up leaders, whatever it was, it was because of the love of Christ. It was motivated for that. Nowhere does Paul say, "Okay, I'm raising up many leaders, so one day I will be known." as an apostle no or i am raising up many churches planting many churches one day you know my name will go into history no all he did was motivated because of the love of christ he says the love of christ compels me right since the lord jesus died for all those who is who have received him as lord and risen savior should no longer live on their own selfish agendas for the sake of Jesus and his kingdom. You know, this is so much for us during the time that we are in. Uh, as believers, sometimes we, you know, we put God second. And we be careful that we don't. That yes, there is work, there is, you know, all of us work or we got things to do Monday to Friday, you know, working professionals, got our own business, you know, homemakers, got a lot of things to do looking after family looking after children all of that is there but our priority must be the lord jesus and his kingdom god i'm going to work monday to friday this week even as i work let my work glorify you let me be a testimony let people see my life and say hey there's something different about him and let me be able to be a testimony a witness of the gospel in the workplace there's a difference. But if you go to work thinking, hey, I, I need to earn so much more, uh, you know, I need to do this, I need to, uh, you, know, you know, build another house, buy, buy another car. Now, all of that is important. But Paul is saying here, as believers, we must not live on our own selfish agenda, right? When we put Jesus first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things will be added. So that's what Paul is basically saying. You look at God, look at things for the kingdom. And all the other things will be added in the right time, in the right way. God will add it. Right? Now, verse 16 onwards. New creations and ambassadors. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things become new. That's a powerful verse. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespass to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, 
we are ambassadors of Christ. As the God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Right? So Paul states that because of the death, burial of the res and resurrection of our Lord Jesus, there is a change in how we see and relate to people and how we see and relate to the Lord. How we see and relate to people. We look at people and we say, God, you died on the cross for them. They can become believers. They can accept you and live a righteous, holy life. And how we relate to them. Lord, this person, my boss is causing so much trouble. He's just, you know, uh, unfair. And uh, I'm just so upset. But Lord, your word says, love one another. Help me to love. So the way I relate to people. And how I see the Lord. You now we look at these challenges, we look at these seasons that we say, God, you know, I know that you are above all things. I know that you are powerful. I know that you are almighty. You are a miracle working God. And so I'm going to relate to you this way. I, I know that you can get me out of this situation. Everything changes because we are new creations. And that's why Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old ways, the old thinking, the old life has passed away. Right? His spirit becomes alive. The born again person becomes a new creation in the spirit. Right? Now, here's the important thing Romans 12, Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our spirit, once 2 Corinthians 5 17 happens, our spirit is renewed but our thinking is still sometimes carnal right look at this church in Corinth they were all believers they accepted the Lord Jesus the spirit was renewed right but the thinking was still carnal why I believe in Paul I believe in Cephas I believe in Apollos division thinking was carnal so that's why Paul says, no, the, the spirit is renewed. We must renew our mind. How do we renew our mind? We put to death the sinful nature. We renew our mind through the word of God. We read the word of God. We meditate on the word of God. We overcome temptations. We, uh, we spend time in worship and all the things that we can do to change our thinking. Right? Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. As new creations, as new people in Christ, we have been entrusted with this message. Now, Paul is not saying as ambassadors of Christ, become pastors, teachers, evangelists, and then go minister to people. No, 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 no. He's saying as new creations, you have been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation, which means what? Go preach the gospel. As new creations, we are Christ's representatives. That means we, we are his ambassadors. We represent Jesus wherever we go. Look at this ambassador of our nation. I, I, I don't know who he is, his name, but... But if you look at the ambassador of a nation, this one person goes to the forum, you say the United Nations, and he, this one person is representing the entire nation of India, billions of people. This one person is representing. So the way he speaks, the way he thinks, the way he talks, everything will reflect on the nation. Picture this, if you've got an ambassador who stands up in front of all the other countries and starts using curse words and talking arrogantly and rudely, and uh, what's going to happen? They'll say, hey, why are Indians like this? Now, Indians are not like that. That ambassador, his character is like that. Now, Paul is saying, you are ambassadors of Christ. Wherever you go, people will see who you are, see Christ through you. We are his spokesperson. And we invite and exhort everyone to be reconciled to God. 
come back to God. That, that separation of sin is removed. They can be reconciled back to God. Through who? Through the Son, Jesus Christ. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Lord Jesus was sinless. He carried our sins, Isaiah says. He bore our griefs. He bore our sicknesses. He carried our sins on the cross. He became sin. He did that so that you and I may be made righteous. And we believe we are made righteous. That means we have a right standing before God the Father. And God sees us through the eyes of Jesus. And he accepts us as his children. Isn't that wonderful? It's remarkable. It's really, picture this, separation from God. The Lord Jesus steps in. Man who was sinless, died on the cross, rose again from the dead. Now, when we believe in Jesus, this separation is removed. God, the Father, sees us through the eyes of the Lord Jesus. We become reconciled to God made righteous. God says, you are righteous, not because of what you have done, but because of my son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. What a powerful, powerful uh, expression of love. He made one who knew no sin to taste sin so that we can taste righteousness. We as sinners can taste righteousness, right? Uh, and this is so powerful. All of us uh, can you know, walk in this assurance that we have a right standing before God. Now, what will the enemy do? He'll come and say, oh, you've done this wrong, you've done this wrong, you've done this wrong. Our response should not bring condemnation because by the scriptures teach us, therefore, now there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So many a time as believers, the enemy comes, he... He brings things in our mind and, and we feel that, hey, I've not reached the mark and I'm, and we feel condemned. No. And the Holy Spirit convicts us. We, can, we have to run to Jesus and say, God, forgive me for my sins and make us a right standing. Don't run away from God, but run to him. Right? So this is what Paul is saying in chapter 5, the ministry of reconciliation. Right? Shall we go to the next chapter, chapter 6? Any questions? Any questions, anyone? Okay, shall we go on chapter 6? Uh, again, chapter 6 is a very small chapter. Uh, and Paul defends himself. Now, this is the second time Paul is defending his ministry. In, in the first letter, he defended his ministry in a very stern way. He says, I know what I am. I know that I have, uh, you people are the, you know, the, uh, the fruit of my ministry. And I have the right. right? Uh, I didn't ask you for any money. I didn't ask you for any uh, uh, material help. I could have asked you, but I didn't. As a right of an apostle, I could have done all this. But here, in the second time, in chapter 6, Paul is defending his uh, apostleship or his ministry and his team in a very, um, he's being open hearted, right? He's telling them, this is what it is. No, he's not being stern, but he's just putting the truth out, right? Paul is reiterating the whole thing uh, in this entire passage here. Let's look at that. By the verse, okay, let's, okay, let's go 1 to 10 itself. We then are workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I've heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience and tribulations, in needs, in distress. Now look at that list. In stripes, 
in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fasting. All of this, how? By purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making rich, making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. This is like an oxymoron, right? Paul is saying, uh, you know, uh, by honor and by dishonor, by evil report and by good report, for the unknown as unknown yet known, dying yet we live, chastened yet not killed, sorrowful yet we are rejoicing, poor yet we are making many rich. Uh, we don't have anything yet we act as if we're possessing all things. Uh, such such a wonderful way to live, right? Such a wonderful assurance that Paul has here. And he's talking about his entire team here. Uh, one of the common ways in which we might waste the grace of God is when we don't work hard to accomplish what God has called and gifted us to do. Many of us must remember this. We must understand this. God has gifted us. We all have many gifts and talents placed in us. The thing is, as believers, we must get excited about what God's call is for our life, right? We, we, you know, people prophesy over us. We have dreams, visions. We get excited, but it's at times that excitement just goes away. And when the excitement dies down, the effort also goes down. And we become complacent, and sometimes we give up. But Paul is saying, don't let this be a, just a moment. Right, with a sense of urgency, carry on the work of uh, the gospel. Use the gifts, use the talents that God has given you. Don't waste it away. Be sensitive enough to not to hinder the work of the ministry in any way. Right, uh, and, and and so it's very important for us, each one of us. Maybe some of us have certain gifts and talents. We know of it. We are not using it. Reason? Uh, maybe we are shy. Maybe we feel we are not uh, good enough. Here's the thing. God has given us that. Don't waste those gifts. Don't waste the thing, gifts and the calling that God has given you. So hold fast. Don't give up on what God has for you. You may see. You may have a vision, but that vision over the years has just faded away, and we feel. I don't think I can even accomplish what I don't give up, right? Uh, continue, continue to work hard, continue to stand, hold fast on the prophecies, hold fast on the dreams that God and the visions that God has spoken to you, hold fast on the word of God that has ministered to you, right? Be encouraged. Right? I know waiting and waiting sometimes. Endless waiting, we don't know what to do. We may end up giving up, but don't waste the grace of God in our lives. It's okay to wait, uh, but wait in expectancy. Right? In our ministering, we need to reflect and check our words, our actions, and our lifestyles. Uh, if we cause other, whether we are causing others to stumble or whether we are stumbling. Right? Speaking the truth of the gospel causes people to be offended. And sometimes they bring up false accusations. They blame the good work, they ridicule, they persecute the church. Uh, but we should be careful not to bring dishonor to God and not to disrepute the ministry by our loose words or by our irresponsible actions. Many, many ministries that we read of have started well you know just doing the teaching and preaching and doing the work of the ministry very well but because of you know maybe ridicule or 
people making fun of or uh, persecution from other people, other uh, religions. They have made wrong decisions. And it has, you know, just broken down the entire church structure. Right? So we must be careful. As ministers of God, be careful. Be wise. Wisdom is something that we all need during this time because, you know, sometimes we have great revelations and great visions and dreams and prophecies, but no wisdom. The Bible says people perish because of lack of wisdom. It doesn't say people perish because of lack of spiritual gifts or anything. You know, it's lack of wisdom. So in ministry especially, be wise. Be wise in the decisions you make. Prayerfully make decisions. Have a team. Talk to them. You know, even at uh, the church that at APC East, the location that we are in, and all locations, right? At APC itself, uh, and the, as a pastoral team, whenever we plan things, we sit together, we pray, and we uh, put our thoughts together, and you know, we carefully make our decisions. It's not just random decisions because we are, you know, talking about lives being touched, lives being transformed. Right, so especially those in ministry, be wise. Right, uh, verse 11 O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open, you are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now, in return for the same, you also be open. Paul spoke the truth in love to the Corinthians, that was disciplining and correcting them. But because of this first letter, which was stern, Paul probably sensed this, you know, uh, of the, the believers to be withdrawn. Right? He says they, had, they are not, probably not. That's why I believe that he did not come back on the way back. He did not visit them because they were, they probably distanced themselves from him. And, and probably they felt, hey, why should we, you know, get such a harsh treatment? What is it that we have done such a big wrong, such a big mistake that this Apostle Paul is getting so angry? So they just withdraw themselves. And it's most probably after seeing that Paul was hurt and he himself was sad. So he said, no, I'm not going to go visit them. Let me write to them. But in this letter, he's encouraging them. Right? He's encouraging them to to talk, to be open, uh, and to continue the work of the ministry. Right? But you don't see any, you don't see Paul being sorrowful for what he said. Oh, I should not have said that. No. He said what he said because it was needed. Right? Very important principle to stand for by as leaders. What you said is said, right? Especially if it's in God's word. Uh, and it's uh, something uh, correction, right? Don't go back on the correction. But again, there's a way to correct people also. Uh, I think Apostle Paul is way too stern. So we can correct in love and correct the right way. Um, but also bring correction, very important. Right? Uh, then he goes on. He just moves a little bit to... Uh, Different section here from verse 14. He says, Do not be equally yoked, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Belial is an idol uh, that was there during that time. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has a temple of God with idols? You are the temple of the living God. As God said, I was, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters. And Paul is saying, don't be unequally yoked. Right? Uh, how, how are the ways that... Uh, a believer can become unequally yoked. One, a marriage covenant. How can light and darkness mix together? So it's very important. Paul is saying, be equally yoked. Two, 
the an environment where one lets the world influence the thinking and therefore becomes conformed to the world hey everyone even believers are drinking and smoking and uh, they are involved in homosexuality so it's okay they are doing it but i still love jesus it's not like i've pushed away jesus i love jesus but i'll just do this also now what's happening how can light and darkness mix together how can the you know, you know the temples of idols and the temple of god mix together it can't happen but it does happen because the enemy is doing this a business partnership where the worldly values and ideals influence the decisions directly conflicting to the principles of the word right imagine you got a business or or even you may be in the workplace and there are certain things that we know is wrong is against uh, the principles of god if so for example uh, you can cheat in your uh, you know uh, your final results in your uh, project you know doing a project you can cheat in the numbers and you can do that but that's a worldly influence and it's conflicting with the principles of the word of god what's happening light and darkness mixing together right so paul is saying don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever right don't uh fellowship don't commune you see those five different words uh we use let's quickly look at that fellowship communion accord part and agreement don't have anything of this right uh the answer to all these questions is a resounding no meaning we must not have fellowship we must not have communion no accord meaning an agreement right no part uh which means a portion or a share with the unbelievers and no agreement which is uh you know uh, approval or a dissent or company with all of this is of no use he ends this by quoting from jeremiah 31 says therefore come out from among them and be separate says the lord do not touch what is unclean and i will receive you i will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters Now look at this that this uh prophecy was both during the time for the israelites and it's applicable even now paul uh, jeremiah is writing to the you know the time when uh the fall of Jerusalem was going to happen at any time right and God is using Jeremiah and he's saying you come out from among them don't follow the gods of the Babylonians don't follow their ideals don't follow their practices don't just because you are in captivity in Babylon you don't have to be like them the reason you are in captivity is because of your wrong doing now now that you're in captivity don't be like them separate from them do not eat the foods that they are sacrificing to idols don't go enter into their temples don't uh, follow their practices and customs don't do that but come out from among them and i will be your father a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters there's got a prof uh, uh, prophetic i think the word is pre pre shortening i forget that word so a, a prophecy which is for now and for later so jeremiah is writing it for them during that time but you you can apply it even now it says so so he's saying the lord promises to continue our relationship uh, a relationship of intimacy uh, with each of us as our children as we sanctify as we come out from the things of the world as we come out of the flesh come out of the things that influence us and we say god I want to live a holy life and then the father will say you are my sons and daughters right so we'll stop here uh we could not go to chapter 7 but next week what we can do is we will uh quickly go to 7 8 we should finish 7 8 9 10 uh so maybe another two weeks uh 
and then we should be done. All right. Uh, thank you so much for joining the class. Have a great week ahead. Uh, I'll see you next week. God bless you all.